Hello there, you're watching L24 Midnight News and to the headlights. The construction of the largest hospital in Africa between Algeria, Qatar and Germany will be launched in the coming days. Zionist forces detained at least six people and wounded several others in a raid across the occupied West Bank. Families embraced in emotional reunions once day after the first commercial flight in 18 months between Ethiopia's capital city and the war-torn Tigray region to the north. The Kremlin dismissed Ukraine's 10-point peace plan, saying that pro proposal must take into account the full Ukrainian regions having joined Russia. Hello again and welcome. Starting from Algeria, the first stone of the Algerian Qatari German hospital will be laid in the next few days here in Algeria. The hospital will be the biggest in Africa in terms of structures, capacity, and medical expertise. Mohamed Khatel. Health Minister Abdel Sayhi announced the launching soon of the works of the Algerian Qatari German Hospital when receiving here in Algeria the ambassador of the state of Qatar and the chairman of the board of directors of the Qatari Elegancia Healthcare Company, Mohamed Mu'taz Al Khayyat. The health minister stressed during the meeting the excellent relations linking Algeria to Qatar. The relations of cooperation and brotherliness that links the two countries will be further consolidated in light of the cooperation and partnership projects that will be implemented. The project of the Algerian Qatari German Hospital, whose works will be launched in the next few days, has great importance and constitutes a new building block in the strengthening of bilateral cooperation. For his part, Mr. Mu'taz Al Khayyat expressed his gratitude to the Algerian government for the efforts made in terms of developing the infrastructure on which the new hospital will be built, announcing on the occasion the signing soon of the final MOU on the project. We will soon sign the final MOU of the project according to the required technical file and in line with the new investment law in force in Algeria thus allowing to strengthen and pave the way for broad partnerships in all fields of endeavor, including the healthcare sector. The chairman of the board of directors of the Qatari Elegancia Healthcare Company also stressed that the implementation of the Algerian Qatari German Hospital on Algerian soil is a leap forward for the healthcare sector in Algeria. Of course, the new hospital, which reflects the strong relations between Algeria and Qatar, constitutes a leap forward in the healthcare sector in Algeria and in Africa, given that it's the biggest hospital on the African continent in terms of medical competencies and specialties. It will also be endowed with a school that will ensure the training and recycling of the medical staff in line with the ongoing global developments. The hospital, which has a capacity of 400 beds, will provide quality services that will meet the needs of the citizens and will treat many of the complex diseases and cases, in particular those which require the transfer of patients abroad. The African Energy Chamber expected Algeria to lead onshore drilling and investments in oil and gas exploration during the coming year. The report Expectations of Africa Energy Situation in 2023 issued by the organization showed that Algeria is seeking to maximize its investment in onshore exploration thanks to existing and new investments that would enhance its control over the sector. Sonal Gaz General Manager Murad Ajel confirmed the complex readiness to supply electricity to Libya and provide its various services in the energy fields. The general manager confirmed on Tuesday when he received a delegation of officials of Libyan electricity company Dico the desire of Sonal Gaz to supply electric, uh, electric power to the Libyan side, maintain and operate stations and electrical networks, maintain equipment and manufacture extra parts, spare configuration and training. Selena Algeria in a move aiming to promote tourism in the country. The Algerian Interior Ministry announced Wednesday tourists heading to Sahara in the south of the country can obtain visas on arrival. This measure replaces 
the normal visa procedures. One of the most gigantic deserts in the world, the Algerian Sahara, is opening its warm arms widely this time to welcome all those who love to enjoy the borderless landscape of a land of sand where in every corner a scenery to be admired and where hospitable people dwell and live by preserving their originality. I'm French and I'm currently in Adrar, in the heart of the Algerian desert. It's wonderful, it's very beautiful. These are pastures as well as mountains and sand in addition to dunes. We're accompanied by the Tuareg. It's very well secured. The food is good. We sleep on the sand. Everything is fantastic in this dreamlike decoration. I didn't know Algeria. It's my first trip here. I can assure you that it's wonderful. For this, Algeria will allow foreign tourists heading to its vast Sahara to obtain visas on arrival. The Interior Ministry said in a statement that foreigners heading to the south of the country who have tours booked with licensed local companies could obtain visas on arrival at airports and land borders instead of going through normal visa procedures. These easing measures aim to help tourists visit an Algerian Sahara consider the real open-air museum containing rock engravings and paintings, sand dunes, mountains, bodies of water, green spaces and a rich fauna. Personally, it's my second time to visit the chains of Tadrat because my first visit was a bit short due to COVID-19. I really enjoyed it back then, that I wanted to come back to discover and to go for a hike because it's fabulous. We discover all the time different landscapes and everything changes throughout the day depending on the daylight. Algeria has also many assets likely to attract tourists, with 1,600 kilometers of coastline, endless mountain chains, and fabulous views. Still in Africa, the Spanish government's provision of financial donation to organization closing the Moroccan Royal Palace sparked a wave of harsh criticism inside Spain, which reached the point of calling for an in-depth investigation into the merits of the case and other similar previous cases, criticisms in which questions arose about whether these financial donations are made in exchange for personal interests of Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez. Travelers expressed joy and excitement outside Addis Ababa's Bowl Airport on Wednesday as Ethiopian Airlines resumed flights to the capital of the war-torn northern region of Tigray for the first time in about 18 months. Passengers said they look forward to seeing family members again after being cut off when fighting broke out. The national carrier announced on Tuesday that it would resume flying the route after a meeting between the Tigray People's Liberation Front and the government of Tigray. It also follows an agreement to stop all hostilities between forces allied to the government and those united to the Tigray Front. We are truly pleased with the resumption of our flights to Mikali. The resumption of these flights will enable families to reunite, facilitate the restoration of commercial activities, stimulate tourist flow and bring many more opportunities which will serve the society. We are ready to serve our passengers who are traveling on the route between Addis Ababa and Mikali and play our part in socio-economic development of our country. I live here parted from my husband and child whom I love. I came here for my daughter's examination and suddenly got stuck here. When I heard the news, I fell to the ground and cried. I'm extremely happy and I hope it will continue like this. I pray the peace will be sustained. When there is peace, there is everything. This is a joyful moment because we are going to meet our relatives after a long time. I'm very excited. I pray to God that the remaining things like communication and so on will also be addressed soon. In the Middle East, a young man was injured and another was arrested on Wednesday during a Zionist occupation of forces incursion in uh, the camp of Beit Lahm. The Palestinian prisoners club said that the occupation of forces arrested 13 Palestinians during raid campaigns launched in several areas of the West Bank. The new government of the Zionist entity outlines its abhorrent priorities and walls of any kind of escalation.
A government of war against the Palestinians. That is the title of Benjamin Netanyahu's government, a man who's looking to build trust on the ruins of crime and destruction. Hours before the prime minister of the Zionist occupation presented his new government to the Knesset to gain his confidence, the wave of warnings of the consequences of the priorities of the government by expanding settlement of Palestinian lands and enacting unfair laws against its owners, consequences that may fuel the reaction of the Palestinian resistance and fuel the fire of a global security escalation. The newcomer at the head of the occupation government was committed to making the settlement expansion fire a priority. Hours after it was presented before the Knesset Thursday, the signed coalition agreement stipulated the strengthening of settlements in the West Bank and the enactment of law that imposes the death penalty on Palestinians accused of carrying out operations against settlers, as well as revoking their citizenship, their residence, and deportation. Inside the House of Occupation, the wall of the new government's policies is already cracked. The major axis of the priorities of Netanyahu's government is the promotion of Jewish supremacy and apartheid. Harsh criticism lined up with other criticism from its former officials, parties, and international organizations. The outgoing Minister of Occupation Army, Benny Gantz, indicates that the seemingly irresponsible actions of Benjamin Netanyahu government may fuel the fire of a global security escalation. Isaac Herzog, the head of the entity, who stands outside day-to-day -day politics, said on Wednesday that in a meeting with Ben Gavir, he expressed deep concerns and presented voices from large sections of Zionist and Jewish world concerns about the incoming government. The Russian foreign minister said that Ukraine must demilitarize. So Gilavrov accused Kiev and West of fueling the war in Ukraine. The Russian top diplomat said Ukraine must remove any military threats to Russia. Otherwise, the Russian army will solve the issue earlier. Ukraine's foreign minister Dmitry Kuliba said that his government wants a summit to end the war, but he doesn't anticipate Russia taking part. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov on Wednesday said that Ukraine's peace plan can only proceed from the assumption of Russia's sovereignty over the areas it captured. Russia annexed Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donetsk and Lugansk in September when Russia carried out referendums that were not recognized by Kiev or its allies. <laughs> There isn't any peace plan by Ukraine yet, and there can't be any Ukrainian peace plan that fails to take into account today's reality regarding the Russian territory, the incorporation of the new four regions into Russia. Any plan that fails to acknowledge these realities can't be considered a peace plan. Russian presidential spokesman Dmitry Peskov said that Russia has remained in touch with OPEC Plus regarding the EU oil price cap but didn't specifically discuss Putin's decree with the group before its signing. It's Russia's sovereign right to respond to such illegitimate and utterly absurd moves, such as the so-called price cap. Now, Moscow did not specifically discuss Putin's decree banning oil export to countries that support a $60 per barrel price cap with the OPEC Plus group before its signing. Although the Russian side through the deputy prime minister in charge Alexander Novak are in constant contact with OPEC Plus countries on this and other matters related to the energy market. Russian Defense Ministry said in a statement on Wednesday that trilateral talks between the Russian, Syrian and Turkish defense ministers have ended in Moscow. The three parties focus on solutions to Syria crisis, the refugee issue, the refugee issue and joint efforts to baffle extremist groups on Syria territory. The United States, NATO and European Union urged maximum restraint in the north of Kosovo as authorities closed a third border crossing on Wednesday and tensions escalated with local Serbs of a 2018 independence. Kosovo's Prime Minister, Minister meanwhile said on Wednesday that NATO peacekeeping force had been given the necessary time to act and remove blockades in the unstable north but this time was certainly running out fast. 
Putting barricades on the road is illegal, unacceptable, and will not be tolerated. In accordance with security assessments, we have given the necessary time for KFOR to act, but this time is certainly running out fast. The Chinese Foreign Ministry criticized Taiwan on Wednesday for seeking to use the Taiwanese people as a cannon fodder by extending compulsory military service for four months to one year starting in 2024. Taiwan's president announced the extension to compulsory military service on Tuesday. Beijing, on the other hand, considers Taiwan its own territory. Realizing the complete reunification of the motherland is the common will of all Chinese people. It is an unstoppable, great historical event. Struggling for the great task of achieving national reunification is immeasurably significant. Dying for Taiwan independence, separatist activities is completely worthless. We believe Taiwan compatriots are highly principled, and they will not serve as cannon fodder for Taiwan independence separatist forces. The United States will impose mandatory COVID-19 tests on travelers from China joining India, Italy, Japan and Taiwan in taking new measures after Beijing's decision to lift severe zero-COVID policies. However, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Wang Wangbin said China's COVID-19 situation on the whole remains predictable and under control. Wong said that some Western media's claim that China has failed in fighting the epidemic is driven or rather driven by bias and politically motivated to smear China. Countries adjusting the COVID policy would invariably go through a period of adaptation. China is no exception as we shift gear in our COVID policy. China's COVID situation on the whole remains predictable and under control. A small number of Western media have deliberately hyped up and even misrepresented China's COVID policy adjustment and yet avoided reporting on the deficiencies and heavy price paid in their own country's COVID response. This is nothing but double standards and is clearly against journalistic ethics. At least 60 people are thought to have died in the blizzard which has brought a huge sweet half of the U.S. to a complete standstill. Marim Zian on what follow. The worst of the historic winter weather is likely behind western New York as temperatures were forecast to rise and allow the region to start melting. At least 34 people have died in Erie County, which includes the city of Buffalo. The storm that swept across the U.S. over the holiday weekend has killed at least 60 people in eight states. There have now been more fatalities in Erie County, New York, in the last few days than during the infamous Buffalo blizzard of 1977. In Erie County, fewer than 10,000 households are without power, and more than 80,000 customers were without power as of Wednesday morning. Nothing has been normal since the winter storm hit North America, as there has been a ban on driving. Flights have been cancelled, people are driving to survive, and even looting has been reported in some parts of the city. Elsewhere in the U.S. and Canada, residents are still dealing with the effects of the deadly winter storm, as well as the new dangerous weather systems. The huge footprint of the polar weather event, the continued extreme cold, blizzards that affected most of the U.S., Canada and northern Mexico, made some believe it could be one of the costliest winter weather outbreaks of the last decade. And scientists say extreme weather events such as the Buffalo blizzard could happen more often or be more intense as the Earth climate changes. Police in uh, Brazil's capital, Brasilia, said that the backpack found near the hotel where President-elect Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva was staying that had prompted a bomb scare, contained only personal belongings. Military police, firefighters and security agents patrolled the cordoned off area around the hotel and the investigation was carried on. The political tensions in the capital have prompted Lula's team to beef up security protocols for Sunday's inauguration. And now for more international news, let's follow this roundup. Police in Indian-controlled Kashmir government forces killed four suspected militants in a gun battle on Wednesday. 
A senior police officer said troops intercepted a truck in the outskirts of Jammu City early Wednesday following its unusual movement on a highway. As the troops began searching the truck, gunfire came from inside it, to which the troops retaliated, leading to a gunfight. According to police, the driver of the truck escaped and a search was underway to find him. And so far, there was no independent confirmation of the alleged gun battle. 2022 will be the warmest year on record for the United Kingdom. Provisional figures reported by Britain's National Weather Service on Wednesday showed after a summer marked by the country's highest recorded temperature. Aside from summer peak, the Met Office said all four seasons in Britain in 2022 were in the top 10 warmest since records began in 1884. Britain's weather events included recording in July its hottest day to date, with temperature exceeding 40 degrees Celsius and a drought declared in parts of England for the first time since 2018. Russia and China have completed naval drills in the East China Sea on Wednesday after a week of joint exercises. The December 21-27 exercises, entitled Maritime Interaction 2022, the ships of the two countries, with the support of anti-submarine aviation, jointly searched for a submarine of a conditional enemy and fired a volley of jet death charges. The initiative marks the latest strengthening of military cooperation between Moscow and Beijing since the beginning of the conflict in Ukraine. Ending up with the uh, sport event Australia after returning to the country almost a year after he was deported, Novak Djokovic, who was sent against COVID-19 vaccination. Djokovic will open his 2023 campaign in Adelaide as he prepares for a shot at the 10th Australian Open title. The 21-time major winner has been granted a visa by the Australian government and is listed to play at Adelaide International which starts Sunday. Immigration Minister Andrew Gailus last month confirmed that Djokovic, who had been facing a possible three-year ban after being deported, was granted a visa. And in this matter, one of his tennis rivals, the Spanish Rafael Nadal, welcomed this decision, saying that Novak is good for tennis. Novak is here. Good for, for tennis, good for uh, probably for the fans. Uh, and let's say, you know, I mean, best players uh, on court, always better. Ladies and ladies and gentlemen, let's have a reminder for our main top stories. The construction of the largest hospital in Africa between Algeria, Qatar and Germany will be launched in the coming days. Zionist forces detained at least six people and wounded several others in a raid across the occupied West Bank. Families embraced in emotional reunions Wednesday after the first commercial flight in 18 months between Ethiopia's capital city and the war-torn Tigray region to the north. The Kremlin dismissed Ukraine's 10-point peace plan, saying that proposals must take into account the four Ukrainian regions having joined Russia. And to this end, thank you ever so much for being with us. For more updates, you can follow our social media platform. And for now, good night.